Um, so I've been working on the history of translation, but increasingly I'm trying to work on a history of solutions to the problems of communicating between languages, which includes obviously language learning and people using a lingua franca or lingua francas, as has been in East Asia, and the use of translation and the use of interpreting and the use of language technologies. I'm more interested in that kind of alternative history rather than focusing on just one. So I'm really the odd man out here and I want to problematize this issue of focusing on interpreting and what it means to focus on interpreting. Now, I have special thanks to, to, to pay to my former colleague, uh, Kayoko Takeda, uh, with whom I worked at Monterey uh, in the United States, in California, and then she left. Nothing good came from Kayoko leaving, except that for one year I got to teach a course called Research on Interpreting. Usually I teach research on translation and I get the translators and that's okay. I got the interpreters for one year. Now these are the smartest kids you've ever seen from all over the place, well from you know, the, the Chinese, Korean, Japanese, uh, Russian, German, French, uh, that's about it, yep. Uh, and they are bright, they are linguistically gifted, and they are very critical, and most of them are extremely arrogant already. <laughs> that is, they're good at what they do, and they know it, and they've learnt already, I'm the practitioner, I don't need theory. And I try to, I'm teaching you research, knowledge, knowledge production, Practice versus theory, practice is good, theory is bad. I, I struggle to get across to them that there's something between theory and practice called research and producing knowledge about oneself, one's own activity. So to do that, I would create problems. I would provoke them. One of the lectures was on the oral and the written. And I, I attacked them in this way. I was working from a text by Michael Cronin, but I said, you, know, you really think, you know, all your big time conferences, like the photos out there with the heads of state, do you really imagine that any of the profound agreements in history were made like that, orally? Give me a break, come on. They, they signed treaties, they signed written documents, technical things, organized by people in writing, organized by the technicians, by the high civil servants, the people who do the actual negotiating. You can't tell me you really need that oral encounter, can you? And then look around. Everywhere you see the written predominating. Power is in the written. History is in the written. Cooperation that extends over years and decades is written. You, you're just the icing on the cake, the froth on the surf. We live in Monterey. Uh, <laughs> and I was waiting for them to come back at me with good arguments why this is not so. And they didn't. So you may be interpreters or people especially interested in, interp in interpreting. Start thinking about how you would answer that. How could you answer that? What would we offer to say, this is different in interpreting and it is substantial and therefore worth looking at? I turn now to, if, if I were going to write, rewrite that book that was edited, published 15 years ago on uh, method in translation history, what would I change in it? There are a couple of things. I would emphasize more the discontinuity. It's been pointed out, I think, by Santoyo in the Spanish tradition, we're getting all the theoretical texts, and you look at them and you say, well, you know, one century doesn't really connect with the next. The beginning of the 20th century doesn't connect with the end. Uh, there is, in, for most of the cultures, when you get the texts and the practices and the names, nothing like a national tradition. I suspect it's different in Japan. You do have national traditions. 
But certainly in the cultures that I work with mainly, European cultures, there's so much borrowing, moving, transfer of ideas. Um, it's difficult to believe. In fact, I, I told Mona Baker when they were doing the um, Routledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies, the second half of which has Spanish tradition, Russian tradition, etc. I said, Mona, there is no such thing as a Spanish tradition. You know, I'll, I'll write that, but it's not the case. Uh, we are mobile people. We are cultures in contacts. We, we get ideas from everywhere. There is not that continuity. And I think that's something we have to look at very critically rather than just assume. Similarly, and this goes along with what I just said about looking at all the solutions to uh, the problems of multilingual communication, similarly, I would look more at all the players in complex communication situations. I'm going to look at an example of this in a minute just to illustrate what I mean. But you can't get much historical explanation from just focusing on one actor, one player in an, an encounter. And um, often, if this works, yep, uh, Often I, I find these days that the best way to attack this complexity is to ask not how did they translate, was it good or bad, compare the texts, uh, and not particularly who the mediator is, the translator or interpreter, which has been the work of the last 10 years. I, I've been closely involved in, in this uh, personification of translation history, of looking at the people rather than the texts. That's okay, that's still a valid thing to do, but it doesn't really explain what went on. Um, I'm far more interested these days in grasping what is translated, what is interpreted, what is it that these people have come together to do? And if you can locate that what, uh, then you can work out what all the parties are trying to achieve. I think we're making a mistake in translation studies when we do things, for example, like count how many books were translated, uh, or do corpus work and count how many words fit there. You know, books are not all of the same value, and they own very uh, many different things, and, and the words in those corpora are certainly not of the same weight. Uh, I think we really have to move more critically to an appreciation of the actual situations in the complexity and the what of what we're dealing with. Now, have you thought about the interpreting? Have you thought about the good answer to give this person who says real history is written? I'll give you some false answers. This, this is what the students do tell me. Interpreting is different because they can do it simultaneously. They're all very proud of that. Oh, I have been a conference interpreter, just in case. I can, I can do that. <laughs> Good answer? Well, I just re retort, well, what about consec? Consecutive interpreting. You think that doesn't belong to interpreting? If it does, then that does. Also, I show a video, uh, uh, eye tracking. Translators these days have to work very fast, and I can show you that there is simultaneity. People read a text as they type. Not today. Uh, I think it's false to just focus, therefore, on the actual act of speaking and the act of writing uh, because the two come together very often. If you're doing sight interpreting, what is that? Interpreting or translation? You call it interpreting, but it could be sight translation. So I don't think you've got any essential difference there, and I'll give another example in a minute. Um, it's not the case empirically that there's one race of people born as interpreters and another born as translators, although there might be psychological dispositions to one or the other. A, a, a survey done of uh, AIC members worldwide showed that about 70% of AIC members also translate for money, also translate professionally. AIC is the Association of uh, Conference Interpreters. Um, so although we all know people who are only interpreters or only translators, there's a very broad sociological overlap 
for economic reasons, if nothing else, and I don't think there's a sociological difference either. I'm going to have to go a bit faster, I think, so I'll, I'll skip some of the more critical things. Okay. Um, the history... Yeah. My, my recent research is actually on the, on the origins of translation studies, trying to figure out where I came from, or we came from. And I'm intrigued that so many of the great ideas that we have in, in Western translation studies in Europe were coined by Russian scholars in the 1930s through to the 1950s and never got through to Western European languages thanks to Stalinism and the Cold War environment. And one of the great ideas, I won't go into it too much, but, but Skopos and text type dependency, all those things were in the 1950s. But the debate uh, came to be over whether the different kinds of translation and interpreting were one or several things. Uh, so a Russian scholar called Fedorov said, they are all one thing, and the basis is language, therefore linguistics. And the main mediator of Fedorov into Western languages, a man called Carry, Edmond Carry, uh, interpreter, UNESCO interpreter, I believe, um, also a Russian, he changed his name to pretend to be French. Uh, he was telling people in French what the Russians were saying. And he took great issue with this. He, for example, did not want to believe that conference interpreting was anywhere in the same boat as literary translation or audiovisual or comics, children's literature or anything else. And he said, no, there is no common denominator. And the important thing is the person. And if you look at the interpreters at the beginning of interpreting studies, they are far more interested in themselves and their brain, the psychological workings of interpreting, than in any linguistic comparison of texts. If one were nasty, one could say, because they didn't want anybody to see the mistakes, which are always there, in written and in oral. Uh, but there was that division, there was that heroism of the prodigious conference interpreter in that heroic age of translation studies in the 1950s into the 1960s, I suggest we're no longer there. However, I do think we should be looking at situations more, and I do think that orality, the fact that we are speaking and listening, is fundamentally different from written communication, just because of the dimensions of time and space. We are here and now. We are speaking to each other. There will be some record of this picked up in video format or a, a photograph or a written text and transported to some other context, some other situation. But what we have here and now is the event. And the rest will be representations of the event. And it's that quality of event that intrigues me and that I think is more related to the work of the interpreter than it is to the written translator. Not because of the act of writing or speaking, but because of the dimensions of presence in time and space. I'm going to give you a few quick ideas about how that works, perhaps. Hmm. I'm going to skip that. Consider this. We had a meeting opened. Did we do this? Was it ever officially? Okay. I declare the meeting open. Okay. You should have said that. Yeah, well, it was implied. This is the archetypical performative utterance because the speaking completes the act. It's a performative. Okay. I, I happen to, I've worked on this. I asked myself, well, if it's, in, if it's interpreted, is it then performative? And the answer is no. Uh, if that's translated into, into, into French or Spanish or Japanese, uh, no, the opening happened when the person said it, and the other is a representation. But it's a representation of the performativity in any case. Okay? What's obvious, though, is that if it were written, 
and transport it away, it loses performativity in a more definitive way. Okay? It's not an utterance that can be an action when written down. The spokenness is what gives it its performativity. Okay? So there's this relation between action and utterance, which has uh, been of long standing. It's at the origin of pragmatics. Uh, we're aware of that. What intrigues me is um, that if we look at the, nation, uh, the, the notion of performatives, I, I, I'm going back to old, uh, old French linguistics here. Um, a linguist called Charles Bally um, derived from the notion of performatives many of the categories that are, were then picked up by Wiener Damelé and became the basis of the way we analyze um, translation procedures, uh, transposition, explicitation, these sorts of things. This is his example. He's just picking up utterances. I've translated from French. So I want you to leave. I order you to leave. You have to leave. You must leave. It's getting less and less polite, more and more insistent as you go on, and then leave the room. You haven't got the message, have you? Uh, imperative. Okay. These can be seen as transformations. And then, come on, get out. What happens after that if that doesn't work? Out, and then, whichever way the door is, yeah, and then throw the person out. Now, this, this intrigued me because you go from an utterance that's highly written to utterances that are obviously spoken. Spoken language has this uh, implication in the situational uh, position, the, the deictics uh, work, pointing to the door, and then in action. And, and Bali was very interested in affectivité, in uh, the expression of emotions and, and, and feelings in language. Uh, he, he's unjustly remembered as, as a student of Saussure, one of the co-editors of the Cours de Linguistique Générale, uh, but uh, he had more interesting things to say, as you can see here. Now, what intrigues me in this is that orality, the, the, the space of the more oral utterances, borders on the action. That failure in these utterances will lead to a possibly quite violent action. Whereas the written language, in making the situation explicit, in taking the determinants and putting it in the text rather than in the context, makes it far safer and more permanent. Okay? I want you to leave could be a long-standing dislike. Uh, okay. Let's not go into it. Your marital problems are not my marital problems, so you can put, put this in any situation that's close to your heart. Okay. Uh, there he is, Charles Bally, uh, and I've translated from French. Now, this brings me to the hypothesis, to, what, to the proposition that I bring to the, the true historians of, of interpreting. If there is something unique to interpreting, it could be this proximity to alternative action, this proximity to things failing, to communication not working, and some other kind of action taking place, not linguistic performatives, but physical action. Put more simply, sim more simply interpreters work in situations that tend to be dangerous. Not just dangerous because of the pressure, the time pressure and your psychological pressure, dangerous because of the orality, because people have come together for that kind of event. I want to move on to an example of the event, if it works. Is it going to work? Yes, please. Uh, this is a short video. It's on YouTube. It takes eight minutes, but we'll watch about three minutes, I think. Just wait. I'll set it up. Wait. Relax. Uh, you have Americans entering a village in Afghanistan. Can we move it down? So it's, yeah. And um, they're there because they have a problem. Bombs have been coming from this region, from around this village. So it's a patrol. They go to the village. They want information on where the bombs are coming from. 
uh, they have to use an interpreter. Let's see what happens. Can we just play that? What's he saying? I, I hit this people. Sir, when I asked oh, him, oh, no, no. Me, said, oh, can we go back about answer. two minutes, three minutes? We, we, we let it play. Right about in the middle. That's it. That's good. Let's go from there. No, no. Back, back 36. Yeah, that's it. Beard, that's him. Good. Perfect. All right. Come over here. You have him sit down. Relax. Again, everything here hinges on the translation, the subtleties of Pashto and English. Yeah, take a load off. The translators have become unexpected power brokers in all this. All right. And sometimes they just don't right. translate everything they hear. Tell them, tell them how, Make it full screen. Been. Here. We are fine. We have no problem here. Is it any wonder that the Americans feel baffled in these situations and the ordinary Afghans feel ignored? Oh. Oh. Okay, he's uh, giving many examples. The main point is that he said if you want to get him the ATMs here behind this road, behind, so pardon me, sir, behind this mountain. Adams wants to know when the village elder last saw the Taliban. He doesn't receive the answer he's looking for. When was the last time they saw it? I asked him, he says, one year ago. One year, oh, for fuck's sake. Are you kidding me? Hey, hey, tell him he's full of shit, first of all. One week ago, we took four rockets from a hilltop 800 meters from here. They didn't see that, didn't hear it. One week ago, sir? Yeah, it was a week ago, right? What do you want, bro? What do you say? What do you say? Two months ago, they uh, came to our village and took the, all the uh, young guys and started beating him. Ask him if he's got any guns here. I don't want to take him. I just want to know why he didn't shoot him in the fucking face. Like shit. <laughs> it uh, it's the same thing again. You know, they uh, they're afraid of the ACM, and no matter how many times you tell them or how you tell them, they don't seem to want to understand that until they they put their. I mean, they're allowed to have an AK per household. If they put an AK in dude's face and shot him, knowing he's a bad guy, Taliban, ACM, what do you want to call it? Uh, they would stop coming here, and he won't understand that. So they basically support the ACM by not supporting anyone. What's he saying? I, I hit this people, sir. When I no, ask him the answer, he said the wrong cook. They give me wrong answer. They give me the wrong answer. I hate these people, sir. Okay. Uh, it's easy to show that in any course for training interpreters about something that's unethical. 
And you can say, oh, it's not a true interpreter. That would never happen with real professionals, etc. I'm sorry, it happens. And if you're going to do history, you can't do the history of best practices, of ethical undertakings, of people acting correctly. The challenge, I suggest, is to understand why that situation happened the way it did. Why did the interpreter blatantly not, re not render what was said? Could he have his reasons for doing it? I'm going to go very quickly through risk analysis of that situation. Uh, it's very, um, very simple form of risk analysis. I assume for each participant that there is one minimal goal, namely survival. In life we have many other goals, but survival is number one. And I'll just stay at that level. And uh, that uh, a mutually beneficial outcome would be one where everybody survives. Now, I ask what risks are faced by the sergeant, whom you saw there in all his colorful language. The villagers, you didn't see them because they ran away. Uh, the village elder, whom you saw, and, and the interpreter. Okay. Um, how are you doing? I have to go back. Can I go back? How can I go back? I can't go back. Okay, go. Take me back to risk management. Up, 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 up. I'm sorry. But yes, yes, this, this one. This, 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 it's good. Yes. Sorry about that. Oh. Okay. Now, uh, it's very simple risk analysis. High, some, some things are high frequency, some things are low. Okay? Some things have high impact, some things have low impact. So, uh, attacks on patrols, high frequency, high impact. Uh, bombs, they're less frequent, so we're living with them. And the sergeant wants to stop the bombs moving from there to there. Uh, uh, other problems are the interpreters and more generally alterity, negotiating with another culture, but they are of low impact. Okay? Uh, that would be for the sergeant, how he sees the world. He basically wants to get enough information to stop these things becoming those things. All right? And he just puts up with the rest. He knows the interpreter is not telling him what was said. I mean, they're not stupid. I think I counted it. For, for 300 words in Pashto, he got 87 words in English. You know, he, he's living with this problem because it's not his main problem. The villagers who have run away act very logically. Okay? Um, they know that the Taliban are there with high frequency and the Americans with low frequency and they are less likely to attack them. Okay? Uh, uh, so it's logical for them to not tell the Americans that they're working with the Taliban and not tell the Taliban that they want to cooperate and they're using a road built by the Americans. They have nothing to gain from saying anything to anybody, especially the Americans, and therefore logically disappear. Well done. This leaves the poor sergeant like a lover who's unrequited. You know, when his girlfriend's left him, he can't talk with anybody. He should just accept that situation and not go looking for information he's not going to get. The village elder, though, thinks he can help the Americans understand this. He has a problem. He can't tell the Americans that he's cooperating with the Taliban because that would be too dangerous. But he wants to tell him this in a roundabout way. He's trying to give him the reason why there will be no cooperation with the Americans. He tells a parable, famous Christian genre for difficult situations. It's a very well-constructed parable with annotations at the end quite logical in this situation, since the truth is going to get him into trouble. It doesn't get interpreted. So the problem is he has the most sophisticated communication solution, 
but he doesn't have the power in the Communication Act. Who has the power? Well, the sergeant and obviously the interpreter. See the situation from the interpreter's position. The interpreter doesn't speak the language of the village. At the beginning of the encounter, he, he apologizes for only speaking Pashto. Uh, the interpreter's main worry is maintaining the trust of the US. He is less worried about uh, maintaining good contacts with the tribes, and he's obviously not worried about the presence of a TV camera and the possibility that somebody would record this, write it down, take it to another situation, and get a written translation of it. Okay, His risk management happens in the oral situation where he has only one thing to do, maintain the trust of his client and to hell with the rest. One hopes that his blatant disregard for ethics has earned him a passage out of the country with the American forces, but perhaps not. Uh, he is worried about being seen as a traitor. He is to stick with the American alliance. That's the situation. All actors act rationally for a communication encounter that is less than ideal. I'm trying to understand worst practices. I think historicity is going to be found in the understanding of those kinds of failures rather than the communicative success. Failure is far more common in communication at that level than in success. I won't go through the theory of how it was supposed to happen, but you can pick it up in the American Counterinsurgency Manual. I just point out that this wonderful document learns from the great theorists of insurgency, Mao Zedong, and um, the great theorist of how to win hearts and minds. This is the US strategy in Afghanistan, who was St. Paul, of course, the name of this university should remind us of that. That's where the expression hearts and minds comes from. That was their aim. The document is very um, explicit about what cultural knowledge is. It has a wonderful analysis of culture uh, going through there. I mean, it was written by some very, I think, three or four very intelligent people who say three or four very intelligent things that don't stick together. And um, the bit that, that is very clever is, is the women. You know, the strategy is well thought out. They know that in this society, the women control the, the minds of the men and, and that um, women, Ameri American women soldiers are going to come in and converse and talk and win the hearts and minds of the Afghan women. Wonderful strategy. What did they forget? That you need an interpreter to talk with these people. Uh, not many of the interpreters are women, and not many of the interpreters that we just saw are going to be up to anything like a woman-to-woman -woman chat, one senses. Uh, that is very sophisticated counterinsurgency strategy with lots of money on it, uh, fails because of naive conceptions of uh, the role of interpreters on the ground and the placing of trust in the interpreters who are US citizens working in the written mode outside of the event, outside of the actual encounter. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of my thinking about invent events comes from a concern to be honest, with the boring nature of translational discourse. I work a lot in the European Union, which has translation as one of the mainstays of its governance. And the texts are boring, not just because they are translated, but because they were written to be translated. Facile, predictable communication, safe, written. It lacks orality, it lacks excitement, it lacks what, to tell the truth, I find in American politics, which is very, very spoken, uh, working from a great oral tradition. One of the fundamental references for thinking about the event 
is, is the work of Alain Badou, uh, who's, who's worked on the event as such, and one of his books is, as I mentioned, on, on St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul, who would promise people enlightenment and salvation because of the resurrection of Christ. And he says, I will not offer you any proof of this. There is no representation of it. You will believe it. And he told them so, and they believed it. No proof, no checking. The truth of the event and the belief in the event brought that man's words to this institution, one way or another. That is a very, very powerful mode of communication. I've been asking around, I'm, I'm, my, my research interests are not in the history of interpreting at the moment. It's in how you can communicate across cultures to motivate people. It's in what I'm calling aspiration. And some of my recent work is, is interviews. I've been interviewing people coming out of Syria, uh, asking them about growing up in a totalitarian regime and how did you see beyond that regime? How did you see cracks in it? And then I've been interviewing people in apartheid, uh, who grew up under apartheid in South Africa, and asking them about their childhood, about their schooling, uh, and when is it that you saw uh, the cracks in that totalitarian regime as well? I'm, I'm interested in that. And I, I, I originally thought that multilingual people would, would see it better than others because they have different cultural spaces to, to play with. Not so. The one common factor in all my interviews is the following. In all of them, their enlightenment or their, their seeing of the cracks, disenlightenment if you like, uh, was the result of a one-on-one -on -one encounter which was spoken. So I met somebody and that person told me this, or I talked with that person. Always one. Think of your own lives, how you got the ideas that you've got today, how you got to be motivated to what you are, to become what you are now. I think that we can see the truth of that, the truth of the event, the truth of what gives people aspiration is in the oral act, is in the face-to-face -face communication, and that if you'd been among my students, and now if I was among those very clever, arrogant, interpreting students, I'd have a very, very good thing to answer back to those who say all history is in written documents. Thank you very much.